Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Connor Houston. I have the privilege of being One Young World Coordinating Ambassador for Belfast. Welcome to my home. And can I start by thanking you for coming to my home this week. And I hope that you have all felt very much at home whilst you've been here. And please come back anytime. There are certain events in your life that you will always remember exactly where you were and how you felt. Well, when I was a boy of 15, I stood outside the main square of this very building, linking with the arms of my family. I had such a feeling of hope. Why was that? The news broke that the people had voted yes for the Good Friday Agreement. Standing here today, I feel the same great hope that I did on that day. Each of you have brought great hope to my home. Thank you to all of you and to one young world. You will never know what it means to us here in Belfast and in Northern Ireland that you came here. Because what happened 25 years ago inspired the whole world. At One Young World Bogota in 2017, President Santos of Colombia spoke about how the Good Friday Agreement inspired the people of Colombia on their journey to peace. President Santos, like the people on this stage today, uh, took huge risks for peace. He, dis he delivered a an historic peace accord, ending decades of conflict in Colombia. Time magazine listed him as one of the top 100 most influential people in the world. And like the architects of our own peace agreement, John Hume and David Trimble, President Santos was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2016. Now, where are the One Young World ambassadors from Northern Ireland? I know there are many of them in this room. Each of you represent the resilience the hope and the global ambition of our people. Our home has given hope and inspired the world before, and now you must do it again. How? The relationships you have built this week have the power to do something incredible, to write the next chapter of our peace, one that you will write together, and what makes it most exciting you can write it with everyone in this room. So let us make a promise, or shall we call it an agreement, <laughs> that we will build relationships based on mutual respect, especially with those with whom we disagree. That we will be ambassadors of hope, and that we will be advocates of peace. Your relationships can build peace, and that's how we can change all of our homes for the better. It is now the honor of a lifetime to welcome to my home and to this One Young World stage, a man who I had the privilege of standing on stage with in Colombia at One Young World, the inspirational, the courageous, and global peace builder, President Santos. Thank you very much, uh, Connor, for generous introduction. Thank you, young, One Young World, for inviting me. October 9th, 1975. I was walking in London, in Piccadilly, with my former boss. And suddenly, a bomb exploded. We were knocked down to the floor. That was my first contact with the IRA. Who would have imagined that 48 years later, just uh, 15 minutes ago, I embraced and he embraced me with Jerry Adams.
In the meantime, I became a friend of Prime Minister Tony Blair. We wrote a book together, The Third Way, inspired by the former president of my university, the London School of Economics, Anthony Giddens. And when I became president, he sent a delegation to help me in something that he called a delivery unit. In that delegation was his chief negotiator with the IRA, Jonathan Powell, who then became my advisor, one of my advisors in the Colombian peace process. And when I came here in a state visit 2016, when you are invited to a state visit in London, you choose a city where you want to go. I chose Belfast, and I came here in 2016 to pay homage to what you did here with the Good Friday Agreement. So that's why it's a great pleasure to be here with you today to share with you some of the lessons that uh, the IRA and the Northern Ireland Agreement, the Good Friday Agreement, uh, gave to the Colombian process and vice versa. Probably the first lesson is that there is no model, no magic formula for any peace process. Each conflict has its own characteristics. You have to learn from lessons from other peace processes that we did and mistakes, not to repeat them. Another very important lesson that has been mentioned here. We need to sit down and talk. Mandela used to say, the most powerful weapon is to sit down and talk. And that's what uh, you did here in the Good Friday Agreement, and that's what we did in Colombia. And uh, there are circumstances. The academics uh, call it the perceived mutually hurting stalemate. I think both agreements uh, were affected by this and helped by this situation, exhausted of killing each other. The third lesson that uh, we applied in the Colombian process from the Northern Ireland and the, from the Good Friday Agreement was the importance of back-channeling, and especially confidential back-channeling. In the, in the Northern Ireland Agreement, uh, for example, since 1972, you had back-channels. Uh, John Major had uh, uh, secret correspondence with uh, Martin McGuinness. And what does this do? This creates sort of a, a, so, sort of a complicity and therefore something very important, which is trust. And that was present in the Northern Ireland Agreement and in the Colombian Agreement. The importance of preparing for a negotiation um, and uh, the importance of having a framework agreement. This is one of the key lessons from the Good Friday Agreement. Framework agreement, a modest agenda, uh, and a manageable agenda. We did that in Colombia. You did that here in Northern Ireland. And that was uh, extremely, extremely useful. I also did something which has, was very useful. And it's an advice I give to every peacemaker around the world. I chose a group of advisors, among them Jonathan Powell, chief negotiator here in the Northern Ireland Agreement, but also Shlomo Ben-Ami, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Israel, one of the architects of the Camp David Agreement. Uh, Joaquin Villalobos, commander of the Salvadorian guerrillas and chief negotiator in the Salvadorian Peace Agreement. Uh, Dudley Ackerson was a 
British, from the British intelligence who knew very well uh, the FARC and their thinking. Those were personal advisors. They don't, did not even talk to the negotiators. They talked with me. But that was extremely, extremely useful. The importance of leadership in peace agreements and uh, the willingness to spend your political capital. Um, I was first selected as president in 2010 as a war hero. I was Minister of Defense. And they told me, continue. You are the most popular person in Colombia, 86, 87 percent popularity. Why do you want to make peace if you can win the war? Well, to win the war would, lasted, would have lasted uh, 20, 30 years more. And I don't know how many more people dead. Uh, and you have to have uh, the courage to take risks, as, for example, uh, Tony Blair and Bertie Ahern, who was here, I just saw him, did at that time. They decided to invest their political capital in making peace. I advise you, if you have not seen a movie about the Northern Ireland peace process called The Journey, at the end, Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness, they say to each other before signing the peace agreement, do you know that we will, call, we will be called traitors? And uh, the other one said, by whom? By our own people. And that's true in almost every peace process. I was called a traitor because I was elected as a war hero and then I sat down with my former enemies to negotiate peace. Many people wanted me to disappear, which was impossible militarily, uh, the guerrillas. So you need to take risks and to have the political courage. You have to keep the process going. Jonathan Powell calls it the uh, bicycle uh, theory. If you stop, things can collapse. And you're always going to find either political or military problems and obstacles. But you need to persevere. And you need to continue until you reach your goal. In both processes, we had many, many problems. And in both processes, perseverance was necessary. The importance of your neighbors in every process. The, I am sure that here the agreement would have not been signed if they not had the support of the UK and of the Republic of Ireland. In Colombia, I had to make peace because we were at odds with Venezuela, with Brazil, and with Ecuador. I needed their support as a necessary condition, and I got their support, and they helped me a lot. And that is another very important lesson to be learned from any peace processes. I remember in Afghanistan, the then president asked me to go there and, and uh, advise him and help him reach peace with the Taliban. And I said to him, I will go when your neighbors support you in the peace process, which was almost impossible and he never did and there was never peace. Another lesson, very important in any peace process, giving your adversary, your enemy, I call them adversaries, and I'll tell you why, a way out. This is a theory since uh, 2,500 years ago, the Chinese Sun Tzu, you know, give your enemy a way out. That is crucial because a very important aspect is to respect the dignity of the persons or the groups that you're negotiating with. And you need to show them that they could have a better future by signing the peace. This is extremely, extremely important. 
also something that I learned very much from the Northern Ireland peace process, the importance of implementation. There are two phases to every peace process, peacemaking and peace building. Peacemaking is difficult. Signing and the DDR, demobilization, uh, giving up the weapons and uh, the uh, reincorporation of whoever is fighting into the civil life. But a more difficult phase is peace building. That takes a long time and that needs to have a lot of patience, a lot of perseverance. That's what we are right now here, uh, we are now in Colombia. And I, I learned about the importance of implementation which we included in the agreement because of the difficulties of implementing the agreement here in Northern Ireland. And that was another lesson that we applied uh, in the, in the uh, Colombian peace process. For example, the decommissioning of weapons here was a major barrier. And in Colombia, we gave that responsibility and was, this was a very audacious move to military people in uniform. You are going to negotiate with your former enemies how they are going to give up their weapons. And that built such a relationship of trust between two former adversaries that, they, that at the end of the process, and this is the first time this is this has happened, when the guerrillas were going from their camps, from the mountains, from the valleys, to where they were going to concentrate and give up their arms, we did not need the United Nations uh, blue helmet soldiers. The guerrillas accepted that their former enemies, the army and the police, were the ones responsible for their security. And that was a major, major change. And that was because we put them together to negotiate, to build trust, which is, again, something fundamental in any peace process. Both, both agreements were built on past failures. Here in the... In the in Northern Ireland, uh, you had the Sunningdale Agreement in 1973 that failed. You had the Anglo-Irish Agreement under Mrs. Thatcher in 1985 that failed. The Downing Street Declaration under John Major in 1993, which failed. And in our case, all my predecessors had tried to negotiate peace and failed. But what was important is you have to learn why they failed and not repeat the mistakes. This is extremely important. Uh, and making peace is usually very difficult and it's more difficult than making war. And I am a witness. I was Minister of Defense. I made war with the FARC. And because I was so successful, they elected me president. But, but then I, I decided that we have to make peace with our adversaries. And why do I call them adversaries? Because a general from the Colombian army, a former commander of the army, came to me and said, uh, Minister, I know that at the end you want to make peace. So treat them as adversaries and not as enemies. And I said, what is the difference? And he said to me, enemies you eliminate. Adversaries you beat because you're going, to, you're going to have to live with them for the rest of your life. Respect their human rights. Respect their dignity. And that's what I did.
And that's what I did when I was fighting them. I started to give instructions to my soldiers saying, don't continue as they were doing before. Any wounded guerrilla, they just simply kill them. Take them to the hospital. And afterwards, the commanders of the guerrillas, when we signed peace, they said, this is, was the most powerful thing that you have you did against us because the morale of our people, saying this, uh, this guy on the other side are not these devils that were, we thought they were. They are human beings, and this is extremely important. And uh, there are many, also many differences of the peace process here and there. Um, lessons that from the Colombian process should have been applied in the Northern Ireland process and in other peace processes. For example, we put the victims in the center of the negotiations, the victims, because before the victims in any war were completely neglected. And there was a an international treaty, the Rome Statute, that was negotiated to facilitate the peace agreements. And I decided to negotiate under the umbrella of the Rome Statute, respect and put the victims in the center of the negotiation and their rights, their rights to the truth, their rights to justice, their rights to reparations, and the rights to non-repetition. And that was the, the heart of the negotiations. And that ga gave the process tremendous cre credibility. I remember when I decided to take some of the victims to Cuba, where they were negotiating, for them to face the perpetrators. Many people said, don't do that. That is going to become very counterproductive, that would make the process explode. I said, do it. And I had learned from Nelson Mandela. When back in 1994, I had been in, in South Africa and giving Nelson Mandela the chair of the United Nations Conference for Trade and Development. I was, I was uh, uh, at that time, Minister of, of Trade and then gave Mandela the chair. And I, I arrived in South Africa, turned on the television, and I, something, I saw something surreal for the first time in live television. I was seeing the victims and the perpetrators meeting for the first time. Some of them uh, screamed, others embraced, others knelt down. And I asked Mandela that afternoon, what is this? And they, he said, this is an exercise of healing the wounds of so many years of war. You have to put the victims and the perpetrators together. And that's what I did in Colombia. And that helped tremendously. And I will tell you an anecdote that for me was a lesson in life. This woman from the coffee region, her name is Pastora Mira. Her father and mother were killed her husband was killed, and her son was tortured and killed. Ten days after her son's funeral, somebody knocked on her door, wounded, and to told her, please help me, I'm wounded. And she put him in his son's bed. Some days after, he was healed, and he was going out and saw a picture of this lady, this marvelous woman, and her son. And suddenly he, he went to his knees, started crying and shouting, please, please don't tell me this is your son. And she said, yes, why? Because I have to confess to you. I'm so sorry. I was the one who tortured and killed your son. And uh, this woman, with her dignity, he said, stand up. And he stood up and embraced him and said, thank you. 
and he, was, he went crazy. Why are you thanking me if I just told you I tortured and killed your son? And she said, because what you did released me from hating for the rest of my life. That was a lesson that I learned, and that's why we... So, and many of the problems that you're having here in Northern Ireland is because you didn't go through the process of reconciliation, of, of bringing the truth out, and a justice system that the victims felt repaired. And I advise any peacemaker in any peace process to do that. And we included in our agreement an ethnic chapter, a gender chapter. It was an inclusive peace agreement. And this agreement has, has created so, mo so much uh, uh, demand for information that we ended up uh, creating a library, the open library of the Colombian peace process. All the information is there. Everything, even the the memos, the memos from the guerrillas to their commanders in the in the jungle, uh, saying, "What do you think about peace?" Everything is there for everybody to see and study, and hopefully improve. And let me let me finish with an anecdote. The 7th of August, 2010, the day I was inaugurated. That morning, I took a plane and went high in the mountains near the Caribbean coast to the indigenous communities that live there, the Kogis. They are the oldest pre-Hispanic indigenous communities, the ones that maintain the pure pre-Hispanic pre culture. I went to pay homage to them as our older brothers, our wise brothers, wise older brothers, and to ask for their permission to go to the Senate that afternoon and be sworn in. And the Mamos, which are the wise of the wise in the indigenous communities, got together and they decided that they were going to bless me with their permission. Said, you have our our mandate to make peace. But also, don't forget, also make peace with nature. Because peace among human beings is not possible or sustainable if we don't make peace with nature. 2010. <laughs> from then, from, from that moment onwards, I started to learn about the need to make peace with nature. We suffered, we have been suffering as the rest of the world, the effects of climate change. So I want to tell you, the young generation, I, my generation failed you. You were betrayed by my generation, by the generation before and the one before. We did not assume our responsibilities and did not take the decisions that were necessary. And you, who have the future in your hands, are the ones who right now have that responsibility. So first of all, I want to apologize. I think I can speak from my generation and the generations before me and say we are sorry to put in your shoulders that great responsibility of pressing a much more effective action against climate change because that is the number one priority and that is creating many more conflicts. Right now there are more than 100 armed conflicts in the world. But when you see the consequences of the flooding in Pakistan or in Syria 
or the droughts in, uh, in uh, Latin America or the fires in the Canadian forest, the consequence of that is exacerbating conflict around the world. And that's why we have to be much more effective in what the world is doing to stop global warming and to fight climate change. I was last week in New York. We launched something called the Planetary Guardians with environmental activists from all around the world. And our mission now is to tell the young people to become, all of them, planetary guardians, to press the political leadership, to take much more effective action. Otherwise, the generation after you might not even be able to live. So my call to action also for peace in the world is press the political leadership, the multilateral institutions for more effective action to have peace with nature because without peace with nature, we will not have peace among human beings. Thank you very much.